Well, welcome everyone. My name is Cesar Mickens, and it's an honor to have you guys join us in this discussion. I want to just briefly introduce my the panel, and then we're going to talk more about them later, their backgrounds and stuff. But we just want to get right into this thing, all right? So this is Pam, this is Beth, this is Heather, and this is Rich. And we'll talk more about their backgrounds. They have extensive backgrounds that we'll talk about in a minute. But this, this piece is on, this workshop session is on project-based learning and accelerating student learning. That's what this is about. Now, I want to start off with a question from you guys to answer. What do you think project-based learning is? Everybody don't have to respond at once. I mean, <laughs> all these hands going up, right? What do you think, man? You know, and the other, the other unique thing about project-based learning, by the way, and this research has shown this, is that it helps students to transfer from uh, short-term memory to long-term memory. And that's when learning really occurs. We were talking about that earlier. That's when it really occurs, you know, and as opposed to memorization. You know, you memorize it for the test and you don't, you don't remember it anymore, right? But that's what's about. So the way we're going to introduce our panelists is that they're going to give us a short introduction of themselves, and then they're going to answer that question, too. All right? Are you guys ready? Absolutely. Right. See how energetic they are. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we start with this beautiful young lady right here. Hi. Pamela Celestine. Uh, my uh, background has been in uh, special education as a special education um, teacher, um, uh, diagnostician, uh, special education administrator, administrator and um, project-based learning basically will, for my uh, forte special ed, how my kids that are LDED are having issues, bipolarness, and those are not even identified, how can they also contribute to the classroom? Project-based learning is a tool that they can also participate and have viability in their learning. So. Great, thank you, thank you. And Beth? So I, yeah, I'm Beth Baker, I am co-CEO of Centric Learning Systems. And really what brought me to um, project-based learning and to learn more about it was probably about 12 years ago, um, I recognized in Michigan we had 30,000 young people dropping out of school a year. That's 180 a school day. Uh, and I knew that I need to look for something to help engage young people. And that's what brought me on my journey to learn more about project-based learning. And for me, project-based learning is the vehicle to engage students in a deep understanding um, and, and really to help teachers become facilitators. Great, great. Heather. Good morning. Uh, my name is Heather Winter. I am from Michigan. I'm in the lower southwest corner. Bring out my map. <laughs> right across the lake from Chicago. Um, I've been in education in some form most of my life, and I've been with uh, the WAY program of Michigan now for nine years and using centric learning with my students. To me, project-based learning, we always tell students, it answers the question, why do I have to learn this? There is always an answer in every project with a real-life application. So when they finish learning a concept, they understand why they needed to learn that, which again leads to deeper understanding, deeper learning. Great, thank you. Hi, Rich Klum, I'm the uh, executive director of the WAY program. WAY program is a non-for-profit educational agency in Michigan, and we are powered by Centric. Um, we have eight different sites around the state of Michigan, um, and each of them um, have a unique way of um, implementing project-based learning into their district based on the needs of the community, the needs of the kids, uh, and the interest. Um, I, I started to work with uh, PBL probably 11 years ago. I was a former alternative education uh, principal and then assistant superintendent. And uh, as Beth mentioned, we were seeing kids that were just dropping out mostly from lack of engagement and connectedness. And what, what PBL has done for those kids is help them be connected uh, to their learning, to each other, in an in a environment that's more flexible and open, where there's less risk of being a, you know, embarrassed of those kinds of things. A lot of times we talk about interest-based projects. A lot of these kids don't know what their interests are. And so we help them discover what their interests are through this process. We have projects that we introduce them to, and we listen to them and think about where can we go from here. What other projects might you like to look into? So it's been a great ride 
totally believe it. Okay. So, Rich, one other thing. What does WAY, the acronym WAY stands, stand for? Widening Advancements for Youth. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So that clearly we know what this workshop is about. It's going to be about project-based learning and some of the practical aspects of it. So it's just not this PBL thing floating up in the sky, right? And how you can use it, you know, based on some of the experiences that our colleagues have. And the real, the, one of the other real key points is it accelerates learning. And it accelerates learning for low-performing students and for high-performing students. And if you want, I have a lot of research studies on project-based learning. So afterwards, if you want to you know, give me an email, I'll be more than happy to share it with you. But a recent study was done by the University of Michigan and Michigan State University that they actually had samples from low-performing students, middle-performing students, and ex extremely high-performing students. And all of those students went up almost a grade level in, the, in six months because they had projects that they were interested in. So it does accelerate learning. And the reason I mention that is that everybody knows this. We're not going to talk about it a lot, but everybody knows what the pandemic has done. You know, I mean, many of our students, and they just had a re uh, research study in Texas, you know, are six, eight months behind. You know, but it's been true, by the way, and I have to say this, they heard it a lot, that it's always been learning loss with minority and economically disadvantaged students. You know, so this is a way that we can kind of accelerate instruction. In fact, your HB House Bill 4545 talks about uh, accelerating, using tutoring to accelerate learning, right? And our colleagues here will be talking about that today. But before we go on, do you guys have any questions, comments, to, to deepen your understanding of project-based learning? Great, you guys are so interactive. And <laughs> So we're going to start. Go ahead, man. It's a project-based learning that we do. Is this more as kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, or who are we talking to? That's a really great question, man. So elementary school, by the way, and I'll give them a chance to, to, to respond to this as well, they always do projects in elementary school, right? You're always doing something, whether it's with you know, building blocks, but they're always doing something. They stop doing it when they get in middle school, right? Now you're supposed to lecture or, you know, do multiple choice, whatever, right? But they stop doing it. So it's, it's really all throughout the curriculum, man, to, to answer your question. And they'll be able to share some of that with you. But that was a really great question. I want to jump out of my seat right now, because I love that question. <laughs> I, just, I was holding it down, but I am going to jump out of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> So when you think about that, that, that is why I get excited because when you think about who should be teaching, who should be learning, why do we keep saying that elementary teachers, um, because they're not certified in a content, can't help facilitate learning at another level? And, and so let's really blow all that apart and say in project-based learning, we're going to start with a universal truth and a question. Can a five-year-old answer a universal truth? Absolutely. And, and that could be something along the lines of, um, who are my neighbors? And, and how does that affect me? Right? That's, a, that's a question a five-year-old would want to ask. A 12th grader, who might be 17, might be 20. You know, and so, so a 12th grader is going to ask that question a deeper meaning, right? Who are my neighbors? How did we get there? here, where we're at, and how do we better the, uh, you know, the life experience for everyone in our community and, and you might even, you know, whatever it is they're interested, right, then you would connect it to that. So absolutely, project-based learning can happen at different levels, but it has to be at a deeper level. Can a elementary teacher help facilitate, this is my dream, right? <laughs> so can an elementary teacher help facilitate that learning? Absolutely. Should they be assessing it? Probably not, right? So it also helps us take a look at how we're using our teachers differently, too. So I think it can be um, throughout all grades, and we need to look at it differently of how we leverage our teachers throughout all grades. Great. So great question, man. So we're going to come on the panel? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But so, so why don't we start talking about some of the practical aspects and strategies around project-based learning. And I really want to start, that Beth is, I was, you are my first question. <laughs> but so, so Beth is a co-founder along with uh, Glenn in the back, co-founder of Centric Learning. 
And uh, to, to understand why they started the organization is kind of the question I want mm -hmm. you to answer, Beth, because it's, it's so unique. But why did you start? I, well, honestly, um, I was in fifth, teaching a fifth grade classroom um, on Friday. And on Monday, I started at um, Wayne Risa, which is a Detroit metropolitan county, um, serving 16,000 teachers, 250,000 kids. Thought I was going to rock the world, right? Right? You, you have all this influence. And, and in reality, um, you, you don't, right? So what you have to focus on is how do you help kids learn? And that gave me the opportunity to take a step back and, and say, like, why are kids accelerating? Why are some kids not? And why are some just in the middle of the road all the time? Right? Mm -hmm. And so when we take a look at that, um, what I discovered was you can keep kids in school, you can re-engage kids back to school, but the same thing, reasons why they were becoming disengaged, even if they showed up um, or if they dropped out, still existed. And so really looking at how do we take a look at those restraints and change it. And again, I mentioned the 30,000 kids that were dropping out of school. That was not acceptable. You know, children are not throwaway commodities. And, and so if I, if I believe that, then I had to say, now what? How do we engage them? And we, I actually started working with a group in the UK um, who were excellent with project-based learning. Uh, but they weren't so great at the accountability piece, which we had this conversation, right? Like you can't really, in our world, can't have um, only interest-based without tying it back to the competencies. And so with that work, um, I actually met uh, Glenn. We were working on our um, advanced degrees, and we started working in his school district. We were able to grow a small school district, 2,400 kids. Um, we started an entire new, new program, and in eight months, we had eight, or excuse me, 580 new students. Oh, wow. So that size of a district, it's a huge piece. We knew project-based learning worked with engaging kids because these were disengaged kids that had already dropped out that we were able to re-engage with project-based learning. From that, um, we started our own business and started spreading out throughout uh, other countries and within the U.S. Great. What other countries? I know you mentioned England. Yeah. So the U.K., uh, we're partners. Like the, We helped with training and, and learned from them. They learned from us. Uh, but we are actually um, integrating into schools in uh, Budapest, Japan. Um, we have 40 schools in Brazil. Um, and then we have, obviously, many schools in Michigan. And then the state of Washington, Colorado, and Florida. And now we're um, really excited to be working with Chip and uh, Pam to be moving into Texas. Great, great. Any, so this is not them talking. You guys say nothing. So if you have a question that you want based on what they're saying when we get into some strategies and stuff, feel free to just jump up and come up here and talk. Just, <laughs> just raise your hand, you know, because we want to try to be as interactive as possible. So Pam, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because she's like the special education guru, right, in the state of Texas. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, what do you, uh, why do you think project-based learning is important for special needs, special education students? One thing I saw that many students that has a, have an uh, eligibility were uh, either given uh, you know, uh, less opportunities, I should say, because of their cognitive abilities or the lack thereof. But, um, and so I, my passion is everybody can learn. Not only am I a diagnostician and special education compliance specialist, but I'm also certified to teach the blind and teach the deaf. And so many schools contact me to see what is the disconnect of the learning. Is it academically? Is it cognitively? Is it the hearing? Is it the vision? So I'm called out to those specific cases to determine what is the major disconnect. So in doing so, I found that these kids are just, uh, they, they, some of them get withdrawn because they can't, they're not, they're not the norm general ed, they know their limitations, they know the issues, but with project-based learning, they can actually uh, have a voice. They could choose what they want, they could choose the interests, uh, the project based on their interests, and you get self-confidence, self-assurance, and you see the, oh, I, I'm important. Right. 
I make a difference, and that's my high. I mean, that's how, that's that's why I get out of it. And so when I found this tool, I'm like, where do I join? My kids that I've seen in the past work with, they need this. Not just, you know, we talk about those, the minorities, but all kids. What about the kids with autism? I'm also an autism specialist. So I see that as well. And it's like, they're disengaged. This allows them to be engaged mm -hmm. with the class. Great, thank you, thank you. Right. If you guys, I mean, she truly is a educational specialist around special education, so if you want to connect with Thanks. her afterwards, please feel free. So Rich, so this, my, the heart in my educational career, my heart was alternative education. For students who have been thrown away for whatever reason, pushed out, I, know, I don't call them dropouts, they were pushed out. You know, so that's my heart. And, and I know the WAY program deals really effectively with alternative uh, students. So Rich, could you just share just a few things around uh, alternative ed students that you're working with? I sure can. Uh, you know, starting back 11 years ago, um, we had a brick and mortar alternative education program. And what we found is we were talking to the kids and their families and everybody knows everybody. Uh, Niles, Michigan over here, just north of Notre Dame. Um, there were a lot of kids out there on the street that, that didn't want to come to school because either the way they felt they were being treated or because they didn't want to look silly or stupid. It's that risk thing. I don't want to go in and, 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 uh, and be embarrassed. And so what we found was as the kids started to talk to each other, this is a place where you can go and, hey, I know you've been working on your dad's floor. Why don't you come out in here? We'll turn that into a project. We can work together. We can be at different ability levels. We can be from, you know, a lot of different backgrounds, but we have this thing in common. And then they start to feel included. This is a place I can go. I'm not going to be called out. And um, it really brought a lot of kids in. We went from 30 kids, probably 10 years ago, 11 ago, I was looking at Glenn, and we went from that to 120 the next year, just by the kids talking to each other. And so, um, and they love it. And like I said, you know, we have projects that they can take a look at. And then everything in the world becomes a project. You're going camping this weekend? Hey, tell me about um, the number of folks that are going to be at the, at the campgrounds this weekend. Well, how do you find the information? How do you think they get people to go there? What kind of advertising? Why don't you write a paper on that? When they're done with this project, they've covered content standards in three or four different areas, and they had a blast doing it. And then we can bring that back later when they become more proficient and even add on to that. And sometimes that leads to where they want to go to either some type of secondary education, whether it's college or, or some other trade. But it, it's very powerful for these kids. The main thing is interest and just feeling like they belong. If I can share an example yes. on that. <laughs> just this year, we ha I was working in our learning lab and I heard a group of students in one section that were kind of chatting. So I walked over to try and get them back on task. And I, you know, hey, what are you guys talking about? And one young man said, well, we were just talking about this place where you try and pull out by Burger King and you can't go left. The traffic is awful, and I think they need to put in a traffic light there. And they were going on about it, and so I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write up a letter to the mayor, um, explain what the problem is, and explain what your solution is. Because he had already brought up a map on the internet, and he had drawn what he thought it should be. I said, let's... Pro, you know, state the problem, tell what your solution is, and go to that place. And why don't you a couple times time how long it takes you to get out and turn left. Talk to the school resource officer and ask him, is there any record of more accidents happening in that area? So we talked about it a little bit, and the whole group there kind of was listening in. And a few days later, he came back, and he says, okay, I sent the letter already. And I've gotten a response. So the mayor had already responded back and said, we do know of that area. And she said, the next time we talk about it at a meeting, would you like to come in and explain your point? So that's already in the works that he's going to do that. But then we took what he had already created and we talked with some experts within Centric. We looked at an content English expert. expert. Content yes, experts. content, an English expert, a civics expert, a technology expert. And we said, okay, how can we align these to standards? And so we found an alignment, he submitted it, and earned credit through all three courses. Now we could stop there, but then we started looking at, okay, what jobs come out of this? You know, civil engineering, you could look at politics, 
road construction. So we tried to tie it into where may his interests lie and where could that help him in his future. So not only did he take something that was in his mind, he made it into a project, he earned credit, and he has some thoughts on possible future. That's and the other kids in the lab, sorry, <laughs> I'm passionate Go about my kids. It. The other kids in the lab saw what was happening, and now they can start saying, hey, I have this idea. And just be, I mean, Centric has amazing projects already built, but we can also take their interest and build projects. Right. And they and felt important. That, that's great. You know, I, I visited, many of you have heard of High Tech High, you know, uh, out of San Diego. Have, who has? Anybody? Okay, cool. And you guys have a similar school here. Glenn, what was the name of the? the it's not a Maynard, it's someone? New Tech High. New, New Tech High, you have something similar. The reason I raised that, so when I visited there, I saw in high school, I saw these students walking around, it looked like total chaos, right? So I pulled one of them, I said, what are you guys doing? We're working on a project to present to the mayor. You know, and, and when they had the art students, they had the English student, an uh, English student, and social studies. They were working on a project together, you know, and it, just, it was just phenomenal. And then when, when I started talking to other students, they were working on something too, but when you walked in, it looked like it was, I mean, what are, what are these administrators doing letting these kids walk the halls, right? But so it can be very interactive. But Beth, one of the questions I have for you, this seems really difficult, right? That, that, took, that teachers have to take the time to develop a project and grade it. it seems really hard. So Beth, I want the, the other, one of the other reasons that you created so, centric it is, learning. So it, it can be hard, and, and, but, and there are best practices to follow. So we can't ask each of our teachers to do the research to create the projects and not get burnt out. Um, they will be able to do this? Absolutely. Can they do it over three years? No, they're, they're going to get burnt out. If they're the sole source of um, making the connections and creating the projects, so that is the other reason why. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when I first started, I did believe every single teacher had it in them and we were going to like do this. Uh, and, and so when I say that you get burnt out, I, I speak from experience you know, when, you, when you're at that intensity. Um, and so what we've done is built with a cadre of teachers and a cadre of students, not in separation. Um, working together to build projects that would be interesting to teach to students and we've done it through backward, backwards design so we've taken the content standards and then built the projects so we know that we didn't just squeeze in a few words you know that might align together I guess like it's, it's really about the backwards design so that when the kids have their needs to knows those needs to knows to answer that big overarching question um, are aligned to the um, TEKS. That takes a huge load off of our teachers. So now what they can do is modify projects to meet small groups of kids or individual students. They actually have the time to sit down and talk with a student and develop um, a project you know, on their own. We thought that at the beginning, we thought that we would have a higher um, interest with student voice and choice of creating their own projects. But well, we found that probably about 25%, uh, you know, at any given time, of the students really wanted to create their own. Um, they were they were interested and engaged in uh, projects that were created by other students um, with other teachers, and just with a few tweaks, you can they can actually differentiate it themselves. Uh, but a teacher can help them differentiate it as well. And so, using a system that can do that, I think, um, is important. The other one is um, the assessment piece. Uh, assessing PBL can be cumbersome if you don't plan for it first. But when you plan for it first, it's just completely integrated. Um, and I think that's important. Um, looking at your standards as I can statements, Glenn and I just had that conversation um, with the TEKS. The TEKS are pretty um, straightforward as being able to convert those into I can statements. If you're not comfortable with an I can statement and you want it to read exactly the way the TEKS does it, fine, do it that way, right? <laughs> so, you know, so, so make sure that your, com your, your teachers are comfortable with how they're assessing. It's important as well. No, that, that, that's great. You know, the other, uh, I know all you guys are, I mentioned it earlier about the HB 4545 and tutoring to accelerate student learning. And 
you know, they passed the law in June, and they've given a, a significant amount of money, you know, uh, for school districts to have after school, in school tutoring, right? Because research has shown, this is old research too, but you guys heard of Benjamin Bloom, right? This is old research that he and his master's students did, uh, master class students did, and it really involved tutoring and competency-based learning. And that every student that they, they did the research on shot up to the 98th percentile with those two things together, right? That's why the report is called Two Sigma or whatever it is. But, and I'll send it to you if you guys want a copy of it. But it's just amazing that th this was done in the 50s, this research study, right? And yet we don't apply it the way we should be applying it. And so that's another thing about project-based learning. Here you have interest, you, it's based on competencies, and, and, and Beth, what I understand too, all you guys can answer this, is that it's also, you know, if you don't, don't want to fail students, right? So this particular program allows them to do it over until they learn it, right? Which is what you should be. You know, in the real world, you don't have just one opportunity. You have multiple opportunities to develop. You know, and that's the other thing that, that this is based on. But HB 4545 talks about tutoring. Can you use, and any of you guys can answer this, can you use project-based learning for tutoring? Absolutely. I have students that use it. Um, Centric has a built-in tutoring um, option. option, yes, where I have one particular student that just feels she is terrible at math, and it's just in her brain that she can't do math. Um, She's progressively making progress and earning credit in math, and she meets as often as she needs to with an online tutor that is a specialist in math. The two of them have made a connection. She feels comfortable with this person, so she always uses the same expert. The expert knows exactly now her level, where she needs the most help. She'll enter the project that the student needs the most help on, they'll work together, and by the end of that session, she submitted something, and when she gets that, um, we call it an award letter, the evaluation back, she sees, hey, I've been successful. And so then it makes her want to use that tutoring even more, because I've, I've learned something, and I've gotten something out of this, and feels comfortable, and kids always say I feel stupid at something. She no longer feels stupid, which is exciting. Was it super tricks or was it, it might have been her curriculum director, who, who also brought up that best practice for tutoring is to use other materials than what they're already mm -hmm. um, using in the classroom. So it's, all, it's a great way to introduce um, uh, project-based learning and interest-based learning, inquiry, whatever, whatever, however we want to call it, uh, to, to engage a young person in tutoring. And the other aspect, you guys, though, so Active learning strategies have been my kind of theme for quite some time. Active learning. How many of you guys have heard of uh, the Common Instructional Framework? Any of you? That, yeah, okay, yeah, I know, because we actually worked around the same area. You know, I was in Brownsville and McAllen, and she knows a lot of people I know, right? So, but, but what is a set of active learning strategies and project-based learning is part of that. But just think about anything that you've ever done around the house where you had to, you know, fix something or, you know, design something, create something. It stays with you. It raises your level of metacognition automatically almost, right? And it, it goes to long-term memory. But just think of the value that it would have for our children doing something that they, they really enjoy doing. But I really want to go back to this tutoring thing because we, we have a problem, and everybody knows it. And the problem is learning loss, and especially, as I said earlier, for minority students and dis economically disadvantaged students. You know, they are behind. Research shows it. You know it. How do you accelerate that learning? So AIR did a study, the American Institute for Research, did a study with middle school students and they were economically disadvantaged and minority students. It was like for six months. So, and, and those students were like two grade levels behind. They did a six month study using projects that those students were interested in. I know you raised the interest level thing, you know, so they got, were able to select what they wanted. But just that six months, they increased by two grade levels. It's just amazing. So just think what could happen with tutoring. 
right? How are we going to accelerate learning? We cannot do it by doing the same thing. We just can't do it. It won't happen because they'll stay in the same place. Or you know, they might progress, but they won't catch up. You know, so we need to take a different look on how we instruct our students using the PBL. Now, the one of the questions. Yeah, go ahead. We, are, we only have like 12 minutes left. Oh, we only have 12 minutes. See, I'll talk all day. Yeah. So. I wanted to say how important it is to me is that not only you have the, those that are in, have eligibilities, but what about those kids that are high performing, the gifted and talented? What this will do, it's uh, if you LD, learning disabled, emotional disturbed, autistic, auditory impaired, hearing impaired, uh, anything impaired, especially in this pandemic, it evens the yeah. playing field. Good point. And I had an it even went. I thought I thought <laughs> I didn't realize we had an uh, option to Yeah, we have out. So so I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. It does it does level the the playing field. I think you're right. And when we talk about that, I think we need to talk about how technology can help level the playing field. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can be a gap creator or it can be a leveler. Um, and if we um, all have the same access to that technology, there is no greater leveler, right? We all have the same access to the same information and the same quality of um, conversations, uh, content, and teachers. That raises the bar for everyone when we do that. Um, we believe, really, when you talk about project-based learning, it's a great modality for acceleration, and it's a great modality for acceleration for all students. So it is a great modality for those students that insist on staying in the middle, right? right. <laughs> it's, like, exactly. it's, like, you know, exactly. it's a great modality for those kids that um, are, are, a little, are a little bit lower. It's a great modality for those that are, are racing ahead. And it's an equalizer because as you're solving problems together, you may be an expert in math and a high flyer, but you may not know how to work in a group and to come to consensus. Right, but somebody else does, and so it really. When we look at PBL and how we form our groups and what we value in our students and what they value in themselves, is you don't get to be a non-math person and you don't get to be a, a non-people person. Right, we're all trying to solve this problem together, and we're going. You may not be the best in one of these skills, but you, you are going to learn from other um, students of how to how to accelerate in that um, piece. So, so Heather, one of the questions I wanted to ask you because what preparation do teachers have to have? What's the, you know, so a school wants to implement project-based learning. What do you have to do, and then you can, all of you can answer this, but Heather, I want to ask you in particular, what, the, what does it take for, to prepare teachers, the kind of professional development? Well, I work with training new staff that comes into working with these programs often. And it's really just a matter of understanding centric, understanding that it really is student focus getting them to just understand what it is and how you break things down into small steps to get to the bigger picture to the learning to that why as to why do we need to learn this um, and just really looking at we're trying to understand where a student is and where they want to get to and understanding how do we now help them move to that spot where they want to be like the young man who had the question you know maybe he had no idea and he still may not where he wants to get to but as a teacher they can help guide them more than anybody um, taking that interest in that level that they have and getting them to from point A to point B and as a developer um, so, so that teachers can be trained in a consistent way uh, when you create your projects and you create your curriculum, you need to do that in a very uh, consistent, effective um, format. And what we have found with research and practice uh, and really working with students and teachers of, of the flow is we know that when we start with the overarching um, universal truth of the, with the question, you know, does music influence um, society or society influences music? I think that's a question we asked last night at dinner. Um, so, so that's your overarching question. Now you have your needs to knows underneath that in order to answer that question. That overarching question is then broken down into modules. The modules are then broken down into steps. And then those steps include check your learnings. And then as the modules add up, usually you don't want to do more than three you know, modules within a project, 
you have a final product, I think somebody mentioned here, and you have an audience. So those pieces are always there, and when you're doing the training for your teachers, they know then how to um, interact um, within project-based learning, whether they're taking um, a project that exists or whether they're creating a new project of what the components are needed um, within there. And there's always somebody there to help or to collaborate with. Um, you know, me as a person within a lab, I know that I always have access to ac content experts that can answer and help and work together with me if I have a student that has a question and they'll, they'll guide me in the right direction to make sure that the student is learning and hitting those standards that they need to know. And, it's, and, and Rich, I know, because Rich is like over the whole shebang, so Rich, how long does it take when a teacher comes in to really develop them with the beginning training? And I know you guys have continuous training and development, not training, I hate that word training, by the way, you train dogs, you know. but development. You know, but just share with us what, what, what kind of teachers are you looking for, a particular teacher? Or? Well, what we find is that teachers that view themselves as a guide by the side rather than the sage on the stage most likely are going to be more open to these kinds of things. That doesn't mean these other folks that maybe haven't reached out to some of their modalities couldn't have. But we really um, concentrate not just on the mechanics of walking through projects and how that works, but the ethos, the culture that happens within the lab. And the teachers talk amongst themselves as well. Um, and so how are we helping the students overcome barriers to, to be here? We have to have them here or online engaged. And how do we engage them? Well, that's through interest-based projects that we can introduce them to. And so part of the onboarding, if you will, the training includes that culture piece and really seeing kids in a different way in terms of how they can learn in groups, rather than individually, and, and bringing all those strengths uh, together in, in a lab that might not look like your typical classroom. You know, Heather mentioned this group over here that seemed to be kind of chatty. Right. They were working on a project. That's that's great. You know, and so it's a mindset too, and that it takes uh, you know over a summer. You know. You're going to implement something okay. in the fall, maybe starting in the spring, along with the technical aspects. And we, you know, in our particular case, uh, we bring a team in to help with that, uh, to, to launch. Now, there's part of that team, our trainer extraordinaire. And then to just be a continual support. They know that they can reach out to us with questions because right. there is a learning curve to be had. And we don't just say, okay, you got what you need, goodbye. You know, we are there for them anytime they need us. Yeah, it's a mind shift set shift too, because generally teachers teach the way they were taught, right? So they think they have to lecture, you know, or dispense knowledge, right? As opposed to letting go, you know, and being kind of guiding them. The next thing before we get into questions and get you guys to participate, I just want to go back to SEL, right? Because social emotional learning and how important it is to integrate that into whether it's group instruction you know, in terms of projects or individualized instruction, it is so crucial. And especially now, as you guys know, the impact that it has had on our children from a social emotional uh, set. Did you want to share any, because I know we talk about it all the time, but. Yeah, um, one thing is um, that with, we see it, you know, all our kids, everyone, every student, every person's room dealt with this pandemic in one form or another. And with the project-based learning, it allows the kids to work in groups, work in uh, projects, but in real life situations. As a diagnostician, I would ask my seniors, okay, you turn 18, what are you gonna do? Because uh, you know, there's no special ed jobs. You have a job. What this pro tool will do, and why I fell in love with it, is that it prepares these students uh, post-secondary, post-high school, to get ready for the real world, to be able to collaborate with friends, to be able to work on a project together and see that from start to finish, that's success. Very good, thank you. You know, so we're gonna ask a few, ask you guys some questions, give you some feedback, but before we do that, I wanna introduce our team. You know, we have Lynn, what's your name again? No, <laughs> sorry, hey, hey. And Jerry. And I thought we had, where is Chip? He's outside. He's outside. outside. So, do you guys have anything you want to add before we open it up to the audience? No, oh, they did a great job. Yeah. 
So you you guys are on stage now. What are you? I mean, what are your needs to know? Right. Well, yeah. There you go, Beth. Yeah. That's a project-based learning woman. <laughs> Another great question. He took your question out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the, the best place to probably answer the high school, the best people to answer the high school you know, is right here. But I will um, talk about uh, my experience about what it can look like and um, why you know, we, we set up things the way that we did um, with some of our schools. So in Brazil, um, our young people are working on both their Brazilian diploma and their U.S. diploma. So that day looks different, where they're um, taking their four core in the morning, and then they're working on social studies and um, economics and English language arts in the afternoon in a project-based way. Um, the rooms are set up in circle, with circle tables. Um, they're set up with a one-to-one -one, um, technology initiative. It doesn't mean that they're all just working on their computers separately, um, but, but the technology is there for them. And um, some of that, in that classroom, you have, may all be working on economics, but you have different levels of um, English proficiency, you have different levels of understanding of government, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of different pieces that go along, so we do stress that um, they answer these overarching questions together, and we have a combination of um, individual work, group work, um, and it's all turned in through the the same system and aligned to the same U.S. competencies. In middle school, it's kids have to move more. I mean, it's like that's we put kids in middle school and then give them five minutes in the hallway and wonder why they go bonkers, right? <laughs> so, so in middle school, we have to provide those opportunities. So. It, it, high school, it, you know, not so much. Like the, it, moving around is not as cool, right? Uh, and so, so there, they ha we have to build into our projects the opportunity to be moving around. I think of it um, as much as a Montessori approach, even. So I still have those round tables. If I don't have round tables, um, I, I put those desks together so that we can have a table piece, and I don't make them sit at the same desk. So as they're working on a group, you know, in a group. They may have um, parts of the needs to know that might be a small one-to-one uh, -one workshop. So I might walk in, do direct instruction with that one small group while the other ones are working on um, different parts of the project. These other kids here already understood what I was talking about on this table, but in order to move forward, they have some other questions. So then I'm gonna leave this group because they're ready to go, and I might come over here. I also, I'm not the only one moving in the room. Because I, I purposely put, would put materials in different spaces that they would have to get up, move around, talk, and interact. So you're not throwing out great instruction that you would do normally, right? Just because you're doing project-based learning. It's project-based learning is the vehicle, and all those great instructional strategies that you would normally be using, you would use. Um, and then in middle school, I, let them move, right? Move with purpose, but let them move. Um, and then in elementary, um, I think that it really works well uh, with the, the, the push to speak so that you can click on that and hear the, um, hear the content. But you also, as a teacher, have to be very mindful how you're grouping your students. Right? So it can look like, um, it can look, even look like a traditional classroom if you wanted it to. Um, I wouldn't suggest it, but I would say it would look more center-based. If you're if you're familiar with a center-based classroom, where the kids are rotating from from group to group based on the information that's at that center, not necessarily based on who's there, you know, uh, is is a is another way to look at that. But there's so many ways to configure. You know, that's my experience, um, I, and I know that um, Heather's and um, Rich's experience is very different when they talk about a high school. So when they talk about a high school, when they say lab, they're talking about the high school classroom, but they, they really wanted to change that experience, so they call it a lab. They change a lot of the names. The teachers are the experts, they're not the teachers, right? Because anybody can be a content, a student can start to become a content expert you know, um, as we look at that. But I'll let you share what your um, lab or classroom might look like. Okay. Right, yeah, go right ahead. I would like to say, uh, before I became a special education, I was in a charter school, and any new teacher, they give me the worst class. Like, 
for real, the worst kids. <laughs> and so, as a, I was a computer pro, pro, programmer for a few years prior to my transition to being a teacher educator. And so, I had the worst class, and so I was like, what am I going to do? Why help me? And so, I had little centers. And so, even my kids, even my rough raft, the, the ones that nobody wanted, they came to my class and they were just, it just opened their brains. So, that center base has been the same. That's how you, you make like little bitty centers, and you'd be surprised. I mean, it's, it's a, it looks like chaos, uh -huh. but the kids are learning, and then I had kids asking their parents to be in my class. And so it, just, it works. It's just, you have to set it up the way you know your students. I knew every one of my little game bangers. And so I had those centers set just for to uh, incorporate their interests and get them like crazy to learn. And it worked. And then they moved somewhere else. But anyway. In a high school, it, it could be that we'd have uh, 20 kids in our learning lab at a given time, and all 20 could be doing something totally different. They could all be working on a different project at that given time. Or we may have a group of students that are working on something similar. Or we may say, hey, you guys both are working on something similar. We may pull, we have one uh, student working on a project and they need to use SketchUp and they're unfamiliar with how to use SketchUp, but we know this other kid over here is really good at it. So we'll say, hey, will you come over and help? So we put students as leaders so that they are actually teaching others. Um, they feel important, they feel like they have knowledge to give, um, and oftentimes students learn better from another student on something like that. Um, but. The students come in the lab, and the most important thing we find is when they first start with us is to learn who they are. Learn their background, learn their interests, and let Absolutely. them know that we are interested in who they are as a person. Absolutely. That's the key. And by doing that, we can help guide them from there. You know, they like Rich said earlier, they went camping, or hey, they come and tell me we're going to be on vacation next week. Hey, take some pictures while you're there. You've got your phone. Let's do a, a photo essay when you get back. You know, get some art and some English credit. So learning who they are, what their interests are. Um, had Absolutely. another student come in and he was, uh, he's behind. But I know he's really smart. Um, and I, he, he was, he had a book with him. And so we started talking about the book. And I said, hey, there's a project, a book review project. Let's pull that up. And he says, oh, I got the perfect book I want to use. It's about Tupac. And I'm like, perfect. So we started talking about that, and he's teaching me about this story, and you know, so finding out their interests and relating them to a Absolutely. project, and then realizing that they can get credit for their knowledge and their interests. So now we're talking. So what we're talking about is an entire PBL school, right? So the, the, having a lab like that is very normal. Now let's accelerate. Say you have twenty thousand kids, maybe you have five high schools. What does PBL look like then? And so that's when you have to define what what. What portions are we, where are we going to start? And so you find your advocates you know, within your schools. And you may not be able to um, use PBL in all of your schools across the board at the same time. It may be that you have an advocate, so you have a cheerleader school that you're gonna take a look at. Maybe they need to be the ones that need to leapfrog over, like over some um, learning glosses. You know, there's, there needs to be a need you know, for that. With that, it starts looking very differently. Go ahead, Glenn. Well, what's the easiest way to start with project-based learning? Right. It's, and it's, it's really looking at competency-based learning, right? So if you, if you know that their actions need to be lined up to, um, to uh, standards, that's the easiest part, way to start introducing it and then building backwards very quickly. But otherwise, the easiest way is to introduce a project. Yes. Right? Introduce a project um, in a classroom and, and work through it that way. Uh, another quite successful way so that people have colleagues to bounce each other's things off of is to start at a grade level uh, and, then, and then move up from there. Another way that we've seen it done is to start with a subject, right? Pick a subject level and then move out. Uh, sometimes it's too, too big to take off a, 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 the whole school. We have experience with whole schools so we tend to talk like very blatant, you know, like, it, I know it sounds flippant when we say, oh, you know, this is what we do. Um, and, but, but that's not where we started, right. you know, that is not where we started. You know, we started with um, three projects, right, <laughs> and, 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 and moved forward from there. Does anybody else have some ideas of how it might work? No. Oh, go ahead. I, I have a question. Five minutes yeah. or questions. Okay. <laughs> um, how does the grading look like? Because it is online. Yeah, good question. 
for for us for us the way that um, in the schools that we work with. The way the learning um, looks is we have I can't we take the standards and we turn them into I can statements, and um, though that's broken down into a rubric. So when you have a learning artifact that's turned in, it's automatically connected to that rubric, and then the teacher evaluates that artifact against that rubric. Then it, it immediately goes out to the um, into the the grade book and. Um, an award letter is, is put there with the teacher feedback so that the student has it, the, te the parents have it, um, any other teachers that are working with them you know, would have that. Um, we actually look at a cross-curricular um, assessment of, of learning artifacts. So as soon as it's turned in, it automatically gets sent to any um, subject area teacher that's tagged to that um, piece so that um, they'll get feedback from the ELA teacher, a math teacher, and a science teacher maybe you know, as it, it goes back. It could be a presentation. It could be a presentation. But is that recorded? Mm -hmm. Everything is. Yep, and, and your final product will also be grade, graded cross curricularly. Um, within the final product, yeah. also, Great you know, question. oftentimes we tell our kids maybe it says you need to write an essay, you know, some or something. There are more than one way to get the information across. You may have somebody that is really artistic and would like to draw something that shows, you know, the stages of photosynthesis. Or somebody wants to create a song about it. Or there's just any number of ways that you can, again, draw the student's interest into presenting that final product. They're, they usually give them a couple options, but that doesn't mean that it has to be done that way. So I know we're at the end, you guys, and I just want to thank you. But we're